Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Ibrahim Fatih, formerly known as Joseph Johnson. I was born a Christian in the northwest of the United Kingdom in Blackpool. Growing up, I was, uh, was always getting into trouble. I got kicked out of high school. I never went to college. I'd drink, party, smoke, take drugs. I was very, very lost, very lost. I reverted to Islam in 2018 and just generally just become a better person, a better father, a better human being. And Alhamdulillah, that's how it all started. As a kid, I was a Christian, got baptized, my Holy Communion, my confirmation. And you know, I did believe in God, even as a kid, I've always believed in God. I was never God fearing when I was a Christian, but I believed in God, I believed in the prophets. But um, growing up, I never believed in um, that Jesus was a Messiah. So even through school, I had doubts, even through high school. So it gone in one ear and out the other. So the things that didn't make sense to me like in Christianity was um, Jesus being a God. I did not believe in this. I was practicing when I was a child growing up. Yeah, we go to church on a Sunday. So Christians only go to church on a Sunday and they go for themselves, Sunday mass. And you know, you go there and you go, go back home. You know, there's not much uh, discipline in Christianity. You know, pray once a week, then go back. Most people just sin and then go back on the, uh, on the weekend, you know, go back on the Sunday. Most of them believe that he will forgive you for anything, no matter what you do, and you'll go to heaven. It's very... The teenage years for me was quite, quite hard because uh, growing up, I thought these things would make me happy, going out partying, drinking, girls. When I got to the age of 18, I was absolutely calamitized by um, money and women and alcohol, power. I used to have a godlike complex. Uh, uh, I used to think I was better than people. Honestly, I, I used to think nothing can touch me. I used to think I had some sort of significance and it was very, very wrong. I, I really hated who I was. I used to think these things would make me happy because I couldn't be happy. Nothing made me happy in this world. I was never happy. I could have all the money in the world. I'd have 10 women around me. I'd have a big pile of cash behind me. I'm not happy. Nothing would be happy. Nothing would make me happy, no matter what I'd done. And the older I get, the higher the levels got and the more I'd get and the more I wouldn't be happy. So, you know, it, it got even worse because I thought, if this can't make me happy, nothing's gonna make me happy. And I was miserable. I was absolutely miserable. I was lost. I had no guidance. I would drink myself to death on the night. No one's there for me when I was down and out. And no one was truly there for me as a friend. You know, they'd only want me to go down with them. We'll all go down together. And what I used to think was a friend, it was not a friend at all. I know that now. I, I have a son. I had a failed relationship. She wanted me to stop um, going to the clubs and drinking and, you know, and, I, and I'd kept going there and I'd, and I'd kept going there, very selfish. She'd left me, I'd lost my son. My father passed away. I'd lost my father. I'd lost everything. You know, my father made me happy. My son made me happy. And I used to think all these materialistic things would make me happy. So uh, my father passed away when I was 20 years old. You know, he just died suddenly. He was my best friend. I was at my um, girlfriend's house at the time. And um, yeah, I was at my girlfriend's house. And I, my son was around about two months old. And my, my dad was at his house. My sister lives there. She'd rang me up saying like, dad's collapsed. He'd had a stroke. Half of his face wasn't working. So half of his face is, you know, is like drooping down. I know she was really, really worried. I didn't think nothing of it. My dad used to go in, in and out of the hospital all the time. He had diabetes. And he didn't used to look after himself, like sometimes misses injections. I thought nothing of it. And um, I'd gone to the hospital. He'd gone to the hospital, they'd injected him with um, anesthetic, you know, so they can pass out anesthetic. I just remember him coming in. We all the sisters and brothers came. There's loads, there's like six of us. And then he got us in a room and he was just like, oh, I don't know how to tell you this. Uh, my mum died of the same thing. And I go, what are you, what are you on about? My father's had a brain hemorrhage. I remember just everyone just crying straight away. And I, I, it, took me a, it took me a while to process what happened. You know, and uh, he was on, on the hospital bed. And I remember that night, like, all my, all my sisters, all my sisters had, like, work the next day, and um, they'd gone home because they had children. And I was just left in the hospital, man, you know, on my own. And um, I was just walking around the hospital all night in circles, you know, and I stayed in the bed with him, you know, and I just looked at him for the last time. And I regret, sometimes I regret doing that because I'm staying with him. And then sometimes when I look back as well, I just get like images, images of his face, you know, so 
I thought I was doing a good thing by staying with him all, all night, and then, but I think like, I tortured myself. That, that 24 hours felt like a year, and he died the next morning. He flatlined, yeah. <laughs> now, the last time I seen him conscious, he rang me two weeks before we fell out, and he rang me up saying, like, I love you, you know that? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, I just want you to know that I love you so much. And I said, what are you on about? And he was just like, saying, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. You know, I'm proud of my grandson. And they go, shut up, what are you on about? I go, Avengers 2 movie's coming out next week. We like Marvel. He loves Marvel. I feel like he knew that he was going to die. And then, like, he told me, he told me, yeah. He knew he was going to die. He felt that. He felt it, he felt it, he felt it. I, I think he might have gone to the doctors a few weeks before and like, he knew he just didn't want to tell us, you know. I wasn't ready, I wasn't ready for the world, you know, when he left, I, I wasn't. In my head, I was like 20, but I was still like 16 in my head at the time. You know, I did really struggle after he left. I didn't know how to live. I didn't you know how to do the mortgage, the rent. That's why I say like, I go out with my friends and I'd get into trouble and I'd do other things. And, you know, I ended up becoming homeless. Um, I ended up stealing, I, not off the shops or people, but you know, I did really struggle after we left. I didn't know how to live. I didn't you know how to do the mortgage, the rent. That's why I say like, I go out with my friends and I'd get into trouble and I'd do other things. And, you know, I ended up becoming homeless. Um, I ended up stealing, I, not off the shops or people, but you know, I'd go to like places like Harrods or something like that where it's not going to affect anyone, They're only a millionaire. I didn't have a passport. I didn't have a bank account at the time. And I had no ID in my own government country. So I was stuck in the system. No ID, no job. I couldn't like progress and I didn't have money to get uh, a bank account. I mean, I didn't have bank account to get money at the time. So I, I had to do these things I didn't want to do. And they put me in a hostel and hostels where um, they put people who's like got no place to live or jail leavers. But I remember they put me in William Booth in um, Hull City. Because it, it was a mortgage, uh, the, the house was mortgaged and, um, you know, it got sold off really. And he, I, when he died, I ended up in debt. We actually ended up in £5,000 in debt, all of us. My dad didn't owe money to the thingy, so we had to pay it. As an entire family? My family, um, they have their own homes. I live with my dad and they had boyfriends and children and, you know, ego, pride. I'm not going to go intervene. I didn't want to jump in with my sister, so I chose to just, just help, try and help myself. They ended up chucking me into Willie Booth. It's a bad place. And they ended up just getting passed around hostel to hostel, you know. And then that's when I started to go decline downhill because I started spending time with, you know, just some different kind of people, you know. And my life suddenly changed from, like, being with my dad, then going through that, doing all this. Then eventually I'd start going to the clubs because I just wanted to get out of there and get a bank account and get some ID, which I did. So I didn't even really used to drink. I did start drinking um, a lot, a lot when my dad passed away because I was, I was sick and tired, being sick and tired, like, you know, I, I was hurting and it got progressively worse. And then uh, other things came in, in as well, you know, I started to go partying, doing other things, starting going to the club. That's what I mean. I started to, um, you know, I don't like to say it, but I mean, you know, I started to do other things than drinking. That's all I would say when I was in the club. Nice, man. Not nice. Um, so Blackpool's my local town. Yeah. I'm from Cleveland and there's no hostels for like people who are homeless because quite a nice area. So I found myself being homeless like full on and then my, my, my government, my council, they wouldn't like help me, accommodate me. So I had to move to Birmingham. So in Birmingham, it was even worse. I go to the Willie Booth in Birmingham, the hostel, and uh, Washington Court, and it's a different ball game in Birmingham. You know, the, the big lions, you know, the guys there, they're, they're not, some of them are not very nice. Get myself out of this hostel. I just stayed outside McDonald's. I just don't want to be around that. I thought, I've, I've been around people like that. That's in the past. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm, I want to help myself. So I'm homeless outside Birmingham. I've got a little turtleneck on. You know, I've wrapped the turtleneck over my head. It's like winter. I'm freezing. I've, I've managed to like get the whole turtleneck over my whole body and I'm shivering, man. You know, I've got my head on concrete. The bottom of my spine's hurting in the morning, aching, aching. And I was outside um, but McDonald's in the bullring, Birmingham. A man called Mossin, he had approached me. He's a Pakistani, uh, Muslim. 
And he's seen me on the floor and uh, he said, what's up? And I said, bro, please just leave me alone. I said, leave me alone, you know. And he said, no, 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 no. I said, you don't, you shouldn't be here. He looks at me, he said, what, what, what are you doing? And then I tell him the story about like my father, and, you know, and about the house. And uh, alhamdulillah, he said, uh, come stay with me. And I said, I don't really know you. I said, I, he said, they, I said, you can have your own house. I said, I've got a house. We do, a, we, we help a load of homeless people. There's a, there's a house and they put like people in need in each room. There was an empty one with no one in there and he let me stay in it. And I said, why, why, why? And he says, for Allah, Allah. And when he said that, it made me smile. And I didn't understand at the time because people I've been around in my life, they'll never do anything unless they get something in return. They'll never do anything of the kindness of their own back. You know, just, it was very, very nice. And that was the first time in my life that from the bottom of their heart, someone, you know, wanted to help me because they just wanted what was best for me. Then what happened that you took further steps towards Islam? Yeah, so um, I didn't know much about Islam. I, um, I studied Constantinople in, uh, in high school. My brother Mossin, he didn't mention Islam for about a month when I was there. People say I was groomed, which means he was pressured and manipulated into joining Islam. Well, people think you've been in jail, you know. It's, it's, it's very wrong, but... Um, the brotherhood, they just started picking me up, building me back up and just building me up as a, as a human being. Not about anything about the Quran, they didn't mention it once, I swear, wallahi, they didn't mention it once. And they just building me back up, getting me back in the gym and just, you know, just, I was, at this point when they found me, you know, I was a very, always very mentally strong, but I was shattered, I was broken, I was in bits. So they get me in the gym, just boosting my confidence really. And then the brothers start taking me out slowly in Birmingham. I was going down Hodge Hill, Hansworth, and all the brothers that they know me, and I'm not even a Muslim yet, and they're calling me brother. They're giving me hugs. It's like I've got a family. And Marshall, it was amazing. It was beautiful. All my life, I've just wanted a hug, man, you know, and then I found that in Islam. And the brotherhood, you know, really drew me to Islam. I never felt the brotherhood like I had within the Muslim community. I never trusted any of my friends. You know, my friends would always try to do dirty on me. Don't get me wrong. Muslims are not perfect, but you know, the majority, the God-fearing ones. We started talking about religion, and I love debates, religious, philosophical. I love having debates, which is beyond human comp uh, comprehension, whatever it may be. We're talking about Christianity. We're talking about religion. It's like we're having our own little speaker's corner. And um, he starts to tell me to watch Ali Dawa and Hamza, Hamza's den, Muhammad Hijab. I'm trying to tell them why uh, the Bible's authentic and I can't say anything. And, you know, alhamdulillah, I cannot say anything. You know, and I agree. You were trying to defend the Bible? I wasn't trying to defend it, but I mean, they was trying to like put the, the Quran on me. I mean, at that time, you know, and I tried to come up with some sort of defense because at the time I was still a Christian, but I couldn't say anything. I agreed with everything that they said. Before Islam, I did not know that we believe in the same God. I did not know we believe in the same prophets. Really, I thought they would believe in something else. And when I started to watch the dawah, everything started to make sense to me. And, you know, and mashallah, it was such a beautiful feeling that we believe in the same prophets. I was very surprised and shocked. Like, how is this kept secret from me like, my whole life? How do I not know this? And I'd been lied to my whole life. Wallahi, I'd been lied to my whole life. You know, from so social media and propaganda and listening to what the people are saying. I was very ignorant and very misguided. And I started to make my own mind up. And, you know, I found truth in the Quran for one reason, one reason only. This is where I found the truth in the Quran, where I could say, right, this is authentic, it's the truth. Hafaz, memorization. If someone tried to change the Quran, the Muslim will know. You ask one Christian to start reciting pages, you know, of the Bible, you know, they won't be able to do it. So the love and the passion, the true protectors of the word of God through the Hafiz and the Hafa, you know, and for me, for me personally, it was the Hafiz you know, that give me proof that these people have so much love for this word, this book, they'll memorize it and dedicate their life to it, you know. And for me, that was a big, big authenticity. I started to meet other brothers and I started to watch Dawa and then I started to go to learn, to go to pray in the masjid and learn to pray. Before this, becoming Muslim? Before becoming Muslim. I wanted to um, like experience and see like, you know, I was interested. They don't have to be Muslim to go into a masjid. Anyone's welcome. It can be Christian. Anyone's allowed in, it's fine, alhamdulillah. And uh, I just wanted to go see. I was very nervous. The first time I went into the masjid, I was scared. I was nervous. 
because I was afraid that he was not going to accept me. And when I went in there, people come and hug me and kiss my head and they just hug me. They say salam, you know. Where, where are you? This with the tattoos because obviously I'd heard that in, in Islam there's tattoos are not allowed. I was thinking, how am I going to be accepted as a Muslim? It's going to be hard for me. I was thinking the Muslim might make it hard for me, but it was not true at all. Just straight away, they say, al Ghafur ar rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most forgiven. It doesn't matter what you do before. If you revert to Islam, you're like newborn baby. You're brand new, clean slate, all sins forgiven. I met a lot of men who was ex-drug dealers, ex-criminals, uh, ex-murderers, and they'd come out and they repented and turned back to God. And these were born Muslims. And wallahi, these guys were so passionate to me. Uh, I was, you know, I have a big passion. I listened to them through mutual understanding. You know, in the UK, we all come from the same place, a lot of us. And these men who have reformed their lives through Islam, that's what appealed to me as well. I've seen people go through rehabilitation, mental counseling. So many times I've seen people try these forms of rehabilitation, whether it be mental health, whether it be drugs, addiction, none of it works. My personal experience is Islam is the only proven form of rehabilitation that I've seen to change a man to bring him out of a dark place like that and change him from the heart, genuine, and just fill it with love. And wallahi and alhamdulillah, and I've never seen that before. And these, you know, martial arts, martial arts, I've never said that. It impressed me massively. At this time, I'm watching Dr. Zakir Naik. I'm wearing my tupi, I've got the jubba on. I'm not even turned to a Muslim yet. And I'm listening to Mawla Yawasali, uh, you know, I'm listening to everything. Alhamdulillah, and I'm, I say, Bossin, he had a son, Zakaria. I said, I want to do the Shahada. I want to become a Muslim. You call and then I take my Shahada. I go to, I remember it like yesterday, I go to Green Lane Masjid in Birmingham. I choose Muslim's son to take the Shahada with me because he loved me like a brother. And, and you know, like, I'm his protege, he's teaching me the things that his dad's teaching him, he's teaching me about Islam and the Quran. And I love him, he's part of my deen. So I gone in there and I swear to God, Wallahi, when I was in the Christian church, when my dad died, after I'd done all these um, bad things, and I say the bad, I tried to repent and like, you know, oh God, help me, put me in a situation where I can get out of this and do some good. And I tried to repent and say confession. I'd gone to confession once and I'm telling my confessions to some man in a box next to me. And I thought, this is not right. This is not right. I did not feel forgiven by God. I did not feel God. I didn't feel that God answered my prayers. And when I do my shahada, Ashadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. You know, I felt forgiven. I felt solace. When I, when I did that, I felt newborn. I felt rejoiced like a newborn baby. Mashallah, mashallah. And I have so much love. And all the brothers, you know, they come hug me. But most of all, I truly, truly, truly felt forgiven. And that is what I, I was searching for. And I felt forgiven where I could start a new slate, where my past is not going to creep up behind me. and torture me, you know, torment me, you know, because Alhamdulillah, Allah is most forgiving, most merciful. At first, my mum rang me, my sister rang me. Before I was going to become a terrorist, she didn't understand it. So at first she wasn't supportive, not in a negative way, my, my sister as well. But now they're all, wallahi, they're all like, pushing me, my mum saying how proud she is of me. And mashallah, that's all I've ever wanted. You don't know how nice it is for, like, for your mother to say she's proud of you and your family wants to be with you, you know. So Alhamdulillah, through Islam and the Quran, I've got my family back and my family loves me. So it's mixed opinions. You know, a lot of people, al Ghafur al-Rahim, very good um, perception. They've got a good understanding of the Quran and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Al-Hakam is the judge. Nobody can judge. But sometimes when I go to Umrah, you get the aunties. And I go, auntie, uh, uh, I'm, really, I'm sorry, I stop. You get the uncles and they go. But you know, um, yeah, some of the aunties and the uncles, they do that. But when I tell them I'm a revert, they go, mashallah, mashallah, jazakallah khair. But I say, look, you shouldn't do that though, because I'm a revert. If it was a born Muslim, you made a mistake. Come on. I said, al-hakam. 